Hi, I'm Realtor Sarah Morrow with South State Ace Realty, and today on Property Time, we get to learn more about homeowner associations and metro tax districts. My guest is Community Manager Rochelle Riojas of Centennial Consulting Group. Rochelle was in property management before taking her current role, and she's been in this demanding industry for five years now. This Colorado native oversees and liaises for the single family homes within a portfolio of eight different HOAs, homeowner associations, here in Northern Colorado. When she's not putting out fires, empowering board members, and accommodating residents, you can probably find her chilling with her niece and nephew or taking her favorite class, kickboxing class. Hi, Nova Shell. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. So let's jump right in. Why don't you tell us what you do and what you love about what you do? So I am a single family HOA community manager. And so that includes uh, doing things, a lot of things, um, but some of those are budgeting, paying invoices, acting as a liaison between homeowners and board members. Um, the list goes on um, and it can be quite demanding and sometimes a bit of a thankless job but I do love it and I think some uh, while it can be very stressful at times I think that building relationships and and problem solving are a couple of the most rewarding things about what I do. Those are great skills to have and I'm sure you have to exercise them every day. <laughs> yes. Yes, and patience because it's it's right. not easy to have patience with it, but it's yeah. Well, thank you for what you do. I'm sure it's a very busy job, and um, I found the HOAs are all very different, and that us realtors don't know a ton about them. So you must answer questions all day from realtors and from other industry professionals and clients and residents and prospect residents. And I I really admire what you do. Um, is it true? A couple mis couple misconceptions that I want to demyth demythify. Um, so, is it true that homes that are in a homeowners association, an HOA, are usually a higher assessed value, or is that kind of they run the whole gamut? I would say I would think that a lot of the time it probably is true. I don't know how much higher a well maintained home in a peaceful, clean, attractive community are things that are quite attractive to home buyers, which sure. then helps with uh, increasing property values. And so I would think that oftentimes it is true. I don't think that it's a hundred percent. You know, if it's in all HOA homes are higher value than all non-HOA homes, but I do think that it is true. So they tend to be. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. So getting into just like what people think of, like when I think HOA, I think shared amenities, shared spaces, you know, clubhouse, pool, something that might be a shared cool thing about where you live. Can you talk about, I'm sure it's so much more than that. But is that one of the draws, and is that true for every HOA that there are shared amenities and shared uh, park spaces, public spaces? So while amenities are uh, are features that a lot of HOAs, uh, it's very common with HOAs to have a pool or a clubhouse, like you were saying, or a, an open space, um, but not all of them do. Some HOAs don't have anything like that, but they do have common area landscaping, and or maybe they offer trash. Uh, amenities for the homeowners so where they're not having to set that up or sometimes internet things like that so it's not it's definitely part of being in an HOA is some sort of uh, some level of amenities but it's important to clarify I think that they don't all have those types of amenities I think um, the, the part about maintaining property values and also uh, keeping peace between peace and harmony between neighbors uh, with enforcing the covenants, I think are also uh, key components of HOAs. Cool, so let's talk a little bit about that. So since you mentioned covenants, you guys have a governing structure, I'm sure, and you have things that the residents all agree to, which I assume is another way of saying the covenants. Can you talk about how you keep the peace and what the board 
and the governance structure sort of does? Like, do residents get their voices heard, or do you have to be on the board to have a vote? And what are those issues that you guys cover? That was kind of three questions in one, sorry. No, that's okay. So, the, yes, homeowners definitely have a voice when it comes to what goes on within the HOA. Um, a lot of big decisions, day-to-day -day decisions, uh, are made by the board of directors, but it's important to note that the board of directors is elected by its members. So uh, the board is made up of volunteers uh, that are usually members within, almost always, uh, members within the community themselves, and they were elected by the homeowners. So it's important for homeowners, uh, for members of the HOA to attend board meetings, especially the annual meeting, if nothing else, because that, that allows them to have their voice be heard and submit their vote on who they think is going to make the best decisions on behalf of the community. Um, but there are also some things, like for example, amending the covenants. That would not be a decision that the board could just vote on and decide, but it would also require uh, an affirmative vote of the majority of the homeowners. So most of the time, or oftentimes, it will be uh, covenant amendments would require an affirmative vote from 67 percent of the of the homeowners within the community, and they would have to be present at the meeting um, to do that or submit their vote. So um, that's something that we run into all the time, where we don't have a, what's called a quorum, where we have a majority of the homeowners present, and so a lot of times big decisions like covenant amendments and things like that can't be made without people showing up and so um, yes homeowners definitely have a part that they play in that and yes the board also makes some decisions without needing a vote from the homeowners but everyone involved uh, is a member of the community understood can you give me an example of what a covenant is or just yeah tell, tell me an example of a covenant so the co so covenants are a set of, of rules and regulations uh, that are created when the community is planned, when the HOA community is planned, and they are a legally binding document. So it sets the rules for the members. It sets the rules. Uh, there are other governing documents, but it sets basic rules for everyone involved, including the board of directors and the homeowners. The covenants are basically the legal binding document that, that governs everything. Rule book, if you will. Is an example of something that you regulate via a covenant, say like fencing, landscape, roofing, conforming paint colors, things like that? Yes, potentially. Um, I will say a lot of a lot of original covenants don't have as much specific detail about those types of things, but what they do have, or most of them include, are rules that basically it gives the board the right, the board of directors, the acting board of directors, the right to set up design guidelines, uh, which don't need to be voted on by the homeowners, but um, so it, the covenants might have a few details, but they usually are quite big. And so it's recommended for boards to find fencing or exterior paint, things like that to be important uh, to set up a set of design guidelines which would more specifically restrict the types of uh, the colors of your exterior of your home or what type of fence you can put up things like that so those are examples of what the board might specifically yes. decide on yes okay um, is a behavior a covenant as well yes okay. so next i was you're right on the money uh -huh. so they're called usually it's referred to in the covenants as use restrictions but it's rules that are supposed, you know, those are the rules, types of rules that are meant to help keep a peaceful um, neighborhood. So things like um, nuisances, maintaining your pets, taking good care of your pets, where we don't have things like, you know, to avoid things like that, um, causing issues between neighbors and sure. also property values, because if people are allowed to do whatever they want and, you know, hoard a bunch of junk in their front lawn, <laughs> it is not attractive when people come to look at potentially buying a home in that neighborhood, and so everyone's property values would suffer. So uh, behaviors like that, uh, there's, there are various uh, lists and various sets of covenants, but behaviors are also included in the covenants. 
Can you talk about special assessments? What is a special assessment? I've come across these a lot when it comes to roofs, and we all know about the hail situation here this summer. So oh, yeah. can you talk about just what kind of money gets put aside, if everyone's required, what they cover? Yes, so special assessments would be uh, would be charged by a board or by an HOA to its members in the event that there was a, a high cost HOA expense that was not planned for in the budget, unplanned or like an emergency or a natural disaster like hail damage, for example. Um, so let's just say it the the roof is damaged, like you were saying, and they need to. But the HOA's po insurance policy, at least with uh, multifamily uh, condominiums, for example, they would the insurance that the HOA holds only co you know ha covers. The whole roof but then the deductible is really really high and so that would usually result in a special assessment because it wasn't something that was planned or budgeted for. Can you talk a little bit about HOA dues delinqu going delinquent or you know do you place liens on property? Like what are the consequences if let's say I'm paying my mortgage and I'm paying my taxes but you haven't seen any HOA dues in a while from me like what do you do in that situation? Delinquency is something that we deal with as managers every single day, and, and stuff happens, right? It happens to all of us, but, um, you know, it is part of our job to make sure that we're reaching out to homeowners that have been delinquent because other homeowners are paying their dues, and the whole purpose is to be able to pay the expenses for the community, like, for example, the common area landscaping and trash service snow removal, all those items. And so it does create problems when people just refuse to pay their dues. Um, and I will say that um, in 2022, there was new legislation passed that actually in favor of members of HOA communities that, that requires strict uh, steps to be followed by management companies and or HOA boards when it comes to enforcing the covenant. So we can't just we can't just place a lien on your property or kick you out of your home right off the bat. It takes quite a bit of time. And uh, so now there's things like we have to notify homeowners with um, certi via certified mail anytime they are delinquent. And we also have to notify them by another method like text message, email, and also physical posting to their address. Uh, you can imagine the wow. additional cost that this is uh, you know, causing for HOAs, but as a result, homeowners are being notified and it's very clear that they've been notified. And also we have to provide options uh, or offer options of like an 18 month payment plan is always something that's required. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear in their notices that they have that option or to request a hearing with the board of directors if you don't feel that you are delinquent or that you should be turned over for collections, you have that option and it's clearly stated. Um, and then after so long, if all of those steps over several months um, have been taken and we still haven't entered in a payment plan or made some sort of an arrangement or received payment, then the board of directors has to vote on each account uh, to as to whether or not it should be turned over to an attorney to begin collection proceedings. So even then, even if let's say they do vote and put it into collections, you're, it's still pretty far away from having a lien placed on your property. Um, so my best uh, recommendation for anybody out there who, who's having trouble with dues or is behind on dues is just contact the board or your management company, whoever handles the delinquency, and make some kind of arrangement. Or if you want to be heard by the board, you, can, you have that right. And so I just encourage people to exercise the rights that are, are given. Understood. Yes. Does always sound like it can be worked out if you communicate. It's, it is. Just <laughs> contact us, and we in the board boards appreciate that because oftentimes people just ignore it for so long, and it becomes this thing. Right. Boards appreciate when homeowners are reaching out, trying to do something to take care of of the balance that's owed. So you're full time, and it sounds like I've come across a lot of HOAs that really have no full-time employee, you know, maybe they have like someone who's a contact person, but that person oversees several HOAs. Do you oversee just one homeowners association or multiple associations within a giant community? And how does that work 
if an HOA doesn't get their own, you know, designated person like you? So I am, am a portfolio manager, so I, I manage eight associations and um, and it's doable it is like I was saying before it's quite demanding um, it takes somebody who's willing to pay attention you know who takes the time that each association needs wow. um, but not all associations need daily attention either um, so yeah so that's kind of the description of my current setup but there are some communities that do require some additional attention and so there's options for that too where we can rearrange our portfolios and you know it can be a feature that's paid for by the HOA to have a designated you know I am their designated person either way but just more time or priority of my time if that makes sense and um, and not all HOAs have a management company but again the board of directors is made up of volunteers, which means they don't get paid to be on to serve on the board, and it does uh, a lot of times require some special skills with accounting or you know budgeting, project management, things like that, that not all volunteer board members possess, and also the time because it takes a lot of time to communicate back and forth with the members and set up contracts and look for proposals for contracts and and so a lot of times they will hire a management company and I think a lot more are headed in that direction um, but you're correct not all not all HOAs do have a management company gotcha wow you know a lot about HOAs I want to shift gears really briefly can you just talk about what a metro tax district is I know it's not the same thing as a homeowners association but what is a what is a metro tax district and what are the pros and cons of purchasing a home that's in one of these districts and is it does it have anything to do with the hoa or do they just often coexist so a uh, metro district is similar to an hoa in the way that it does have a government structure a governance structure that uh, of a board of directors that's elected by its members um, to help make decisions, um, but there are a lot of differences, mainly in regards to infrastructure. So um, in an HOA, infrastructure like um, roads or utilities or transportation, things like that, or rec even recreation, community recreation, um, those things are generally not something that would be part of an HOA, but in a planned metro district, um, those are the types of those are the types of amenities that would be included. And another difference is that HOAs do not charge property tax; they don't have the right to levy taxes on its members. And the setup with the metro district is that it's paid for via bonds that are, are obtained by the developer. And those bonds are repaid then by mm -hmm. the homeowner's property taxes. Gotcha. So I, I think I'm hearing that metro tax districts, they have the right to tax a resident separate from their city regular property taxes. Um, and they're not an HOA, but they do provide products and services that maybe the HOA and or the city is not providing? Like they go above and beyond? Yes. Okay. That's the relationship with the builder though. That's really interesting, I didn't know that. Or the developer, yes. So the builder and developer aren't necessarily always the same and Thank that's an important key piece to that, but right. the it's the developer. So the developer is you know, planning this community. Okay. Um, and and a, a couple of pros to that are, you know, um, potentially lower down payments for home buyers mm. uh, that are buying homes in the community. And then also a um, quicker quicker development because when developers are able to plan the community the way that they can and, and be able to levy those taxes, they can use that money to speed up the process, if that makes sense. Gotcha. So those are a couple. So it's like, yeah. it's like bonus funding for the developer that the residents will reap the benefits of once that's the stuff. idea. Okay, yes. got it. Awesome. I appreciate that. Like, it seems like some of us realtors, like, we notice them, we kind of explain them to our clients, we know roughly what they are, but I, 
I don't know, I've never really understood exactly the differences, so I appreciate you distinguishing. And I have no other questions. You've been such a wealth of knowledge. You've been so articulate. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you for having me. It's oh, been a pleasure. You bet. That's the proper tea.